Good evening and welcome to the Thursday, November 14th, 2013 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. I'm Mayor David Narkowitz and we'll begin this evening's meeting by asking the clerk to call the roll of the school committee. Here. Present. Here. 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 Present. Present. Okay, so uh, we have a quorum. Uh, so our next item on our agenda is our public comment period, uh, where we allot uh, three minutes to members of the public to speak in public comment. Um, we have one person signed up this evening. Um, I would just ask if you would step to the podium and just state your name and address for the record, and I will. Uh, I have a timer for the three minutes. So, thank you very much. My name is Douglas Reed. 10 Shelley Lane, Feeding Hills, Massachusetts. Um, thanks for your time. Uh, I'm a resident and taxpayer of Agawam and the parent of a football player. On the uh, November 8th playoff game between Northampton and Agawam, uh, it was a real hard fought game and I want to say congratulations to the team for really stepping up and exhibiting good sportsmanship. Um, at the end of the game, one of the players stepped across the backfield while the ball was being kneed and timed out to shake hands and I thought that was really, really commendable. Uh, football, as you know, is a game of emotion and sometimes things can get ahead of themselves. There was a contest between Agawam and Northampton back on October 11th and at that time emotion got ahead of itself. Uh, as a resident and again parent of a football player, one of the things that I found very disturbing is that at the conclusion of the game, a player or players from the Northampton team chose to damage our girls' locker room by smashing some lockers and tearing doors off. With the tough economic times affecting all the districts, I think you guys can appreciate that it's something that's just not acceptable. The, uh, our town is going through Title IX compliance because of not having a girls' team room and then we have a girl's locker room get smashed. Uh, it's just not right. I understand that you guys were billed for it. There was a bill sent. Um, a couple of things that I bring up that is a question is, when this was going on, where was the coaching staff? I'm not here to make, a, make anything hard, but I think it, we need to take this as a lesson. Um, you know, the actions of a few re reflect completely on the whole team and I, and I think it's a shame. I know as a parent if that happened with an Agawam team at a visiting place, I'd be equally upset as I am about this incident. Um, the athletic director did take the high road. Uh, there was no police report made and no complaint sent to the MIAA. Um, I just wanted to make you guys aware of it. that. It's just something that we found very acceptable and very disturbing, very disturbing. Um, but on a high note, I wish the team from Northampton good luck against the East Long Meadow team this Friday and continue with football. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. What Thank you. We, yeah, we, oh, we can, we can uh, find that information. That was, oh, I'm sorry. October 11th. Yeah. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Okay, um, is there anyone else who wishes to speak in public comment? Okay, um, hearing none, we'll then move on to announcements. Are there any announcements from the school committee? Okay, hearing no announcements, we'll move on to our recommended actions. Um, we have a consent agenda vote uh, for this evening that includes the following items the approval of minutes from the superintendent search committee meeting of September 25th, 2013, school committee meeting of October 10th, 2013, <coughs> special school committee meeting October 23rd and October 28th, 2013. We also have two contracts. One is for Hydratech engineered products uh, for $29,890. That's for repairs to stormwater drainage system piping at Northampton High School. 
and Utactics Incorporated uh, special, special Education IEP software, $13,050. We also have field trip requests. The Northampton High School Academic Team to Burlington, Vermont, December 6th through 7th, 2013. The Northampton High School Robotics Team to Hartford, Connecticut, March 29th through the 30th of 2014. The JFK 8th Grade Chorus to New York City, April 2nd, 2014. JFK 8th Grade Spanish Students, uh, New York City, April 9th, 2014. And the Northampton High School Concert Band New York City, April 16th through the 19th of 2014. Can I get a motion to approve the consent agenda? Who's supposed to be out there talking to the guy who just spoke? Uh, if, if a member uh, leaves the, the school committee floor, they uh, I, I can't really control that if members uh, want to step away. Okay. Um, is there a motion? Uh, to Given that we haven't had a chance to look at these field trips, I'm wondering if we could just take a moment to just do a quick review, or do you want to take a, a vote um, on the first part and give us a minute after? Or certainly. Uh, I, I just sure. Why don't we um, take a five-minute recess? I'm sorry, but I don't want to. It's okay. No, we'll take a five-minute recess, um, and we will uh, resume once uh, committee members have had a chance to review those forms. Welcome back to the uh, November 14th, 2013 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. We're just coming out of a brief recess. Um, uh, we are currently uh, considering the consent agenda, uh, which consists of a series of minutes, uh, contracts, and field trip requests. And I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Okay. There's a motion made and seconded by Ms. Pick. Um, all those in favor of approving the consent agenda say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, the consent agenda items are approved. Uh, the next item on the agenda are reports and recommendations. Uh, I do not see any of our student representatives this evening. Uh, so we will move on to um, uh, a, a vote on a legal services recommendation. Um, and I will um, turn the floor over to uh, okay. the superintendent. And there is a brief memo in the packet that you received tonight um, that outlines uh, this particular agenda item. Okay. Um, if you remember at our last school committee meeting, I indicated that the current contract for legal services had expired on June 30th of 2013. And that I had discussed that with the chair and the vice chair. It was agreed that requests for proposals would be solicited for general legal services and that um, the chair, the vice chair, um, and uh, myself, we interviewed representatives from three law firms, uh, Merrick O'Connell, Murphy Hess Toomey and Lahane, and Sullivan Hayes and Quinn. And based on the needs of the district and the fact that uh, this is a Western Mass firm, uh, which allows for immediate accessibility was the unanimous recommendation of the three people on the committee that the law firm of Sullivan, Hayes, and Quinn be hired mm -hmm. to provide the general and employment legal services on a monthly retainer basis. And then I've given some information on the current structure uh, rate system. Currently the hourly rate is $225 an hour for an attorney, $125 an hour for uh, law clerks and paralegals. Uh, however, um, Sullivan, Hayes, and Quinn, in recognition of Northampton's current fiscal needs and the recent override structure, uh, would be uh, looking to do a general three-year phase-in. Uh, in the first year, it would be $200 an hour. The second year, $215 an hour. And the last year, $225 per hour in terms of the legal cost uh, for an attorney. And. Um, I would say that having a retainer makes it a lot easier for your superintendent, whomever that may be, to get some quick advice uh, without feeling that they're running up a tab. 
So um, what would happen from here, assuming that you would approve the recommendation from the three people who did the interviews, um, we would work with the law firm in terms of trying to um, guesstimate to the best of our ability um, the number of hours we would be looking to use in a year and an appropriate retainer. <coughs> to do that, we will go back three years in our district in terms of the amount of money that was uh, approved by the board in the budget, the amount of money that was actually spent, and then do some estimating in terms of where we'll be looking at going. Obviously, you've just completed negotiations, so you would not need to put money aside for that. And indeed, this is not for negotiations. We're looking at general law issues uh, and employment law. Um, things that might come out from the contract that would need to be um, decided, um, things that sort of come up in districts from time to time. We're not looking at special education services. We still have um, Regina Tate, um, who's our person through the collaborative we're able to call uh, for special education. And we're not looking at someone to conduct negotiations at this point. Be happy to answer questions, as I'm sure um, uh, our two board members would as well. So that is the recommendation put forward um, uh, for the school committee's consideration. <coughs> I'd like to make a motion to accept um, okay. the Sullivan, Hayes, and Quinn. Okay. As recommended by everybody. Is there a second for purposes of discussion? Okay, so it's motion's been made and seconded. Uh, Ms. Minnick. Will, uh, will we be, uh, what's the word assigned? <coughs> will we have a, a go-to attorney? Yes. Okay. And only if that person isn't available would we deal with someone else. But we would have somebody. That, that is correct, yes. Gain familiarity be. with our district. Yes, and absolutely. Am I correct that they had the contract previously? No, they did no. not. Okay, our previous attorney. General counsel yes. was Merrick O'Connor. Oh, okay. They also did collect. Oh, I'm sorry. So you're recommending Sullivan? I'm sorry, but um, so Merrick O'Connell did both. Well, I think you were referring to the retainer related to general legal. Yeah. You were right. Trying to distinguish between collective bargaining right. and right. general. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, we also had, as you recall, there had been years a, ago at Etheridge. At Etheridge. Right. And I don't even recall, well. I, I wasn't even aware that, I, and this could just be selective memory, <laughs> but I wasn't even aware that he was no longer our counsel. That's why I was asking who we had been using for general counsel. The firm of Merrick O'Connor you've been okay. using okay. most recently. For both collective bargaining and for this. And general law. Yeah. Okay, which I find to be almost a conflict of interest, so I'm pleased to have two separated. Yes, except we're still, we're not retaining, um, we're not retaining Myrick O'Connell. Uh, this, they would be, uh, we would be retaining Sullivan, Hayes, and Quinn. They would be doing collective bargaining, but they would also, but the retainer piece would be for general legal questions. Okay, now I'm confused. Which is again. the arrangement that we had been, we've been operating under with the current firm. Which I find to be a conflict, if, and which concerns me. What would be the well, conflict? I'll, I'll tell you what happened. I mean, uh, first of all, the, the attorneys for collective bargaining should be, uh, uh, by rights, report to the school committee. Okay, they're our for counsel. Bargaining, yes. For collective bargaining, the attorney is our counsel. And there was a situation a few years ago where the those attorneys were used by the, the superintendent to come to us regarding a contract, an employment contract for that superintendent. And but that would be. That seemed to me that now the, the same people that represent us were representing yeah, someone that, else, and it seemed that was inappropriate. That was right. mushy yeah. and muddy, and I didn't yeah. like that situation at all. The school district attorney represents the school district, does not represent the superintendent. Exactly, a but I don't know. Our contract issue with the superintendent. The superintendent needs to get his or her, her own attorney. But I, or consult I guess the MAS. I guess the concern is then if you have, if you have attorneys that are serving both as collective bargaining counsel 
They're not collective bargaining for a superintendent. A superintendent is not part of collective bargaining. I understand, but if they are our employee and our counsel for something, and then suddenly they're being called, I can assure you by, that any by attorney, someone to yeah. use in a different yeah any reputable attorney would way. not accept that arrangement. Yeah. They would recuse. They would yeah that would just not be appropriate to be doing an individual employment negotiation on behalf of one employee. Yeah. It just wouldn't happen. Um, it may have happened in the past, yeah. but um, it, it, it certainly did. Yeah, but it, I can. It would not happen. Uh, okay. Could not happen. Um, Should not happen. I know that. Yes. But. Yeah. Um, it certainly didn't happen for the last two years when we've been working on with one firm doing both of those services. Um, <coughs> and even though there's not collective bargaining going on, this attorney would still be called on for interpretation, contract interpretation as well which is sort of an ongoing part of that process. Yeah. Are there other questions? I just have one. You said um, that this is a Western Mass firm. Where are the other two from? And Merrick O'Connell, is it O'Connell or O'Connor? O'Connell. It's out of Worcester. Okay. Merrick O'Connell's okay. in Worcester. Okay. And uh, Sullivan Hayes and Quinn is in Springfield. Okay. And as Tooney and Elaine is also Springfield. Okay. And so um, was there another reason that really just popped out as far as why we wanted them? Or was it, I mean, did it just come down to the all Murphy, the Hesse, Tumi, and Lahane mm -hmm. uh, were reluctant to enter into a retainer contract. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is the understanding that we would still be working with Merrick O'Connell for negotiation issues? No, that's no. not an understanding at all. Yeah, the because they they've been under retainer for that. There, yeah. it ended on June thirtieth. Yeah, the contract is finished. Yeah, this would be yeah. Sullivan Hayes and Quinn would be doing all of our employment employment law related law, including including collective bargaining, okay. just as Myrick O'Connell was doing. Okay. But it, so general counseling. General exactly, general to the counsel. extent that that is an issue. I mean, if we have um, Although, uh, most of real our, estate litigation or something. Yeah. That we, uh, Although I, I would still say most of our general law, it relates to employment law. Most of our, I mean, we don't sell real estate very often. Um, so I, I would still say even 90% of the general law we're doing is a reference back to the contract and employment rights and things like that. So. Occasionally we have questions regarding uh, just uh, education law in general mm -hmm. <coughs> and so it's nice to have a firm that specializes in education law so I appreciate that we are going in that direction rather uh, because I mean that was a I guess a disadvantage mm -hmm. for, for the um, council that we had Mm -hmm. a while back mm -hmm. was that wasn't a specialty for that person so uh, but I, I do still I'm still a little I'm, I'm actually more confused now than I was a couple of minutes ago <laughs> so in in my memory in past years we had Merrick O'Connell under under retainer for negotiation um, assistance and we had Ed Etheridge under retainer for education oh, but I think you're using the term retainer diff differently they were under contract uh, but they were charging an hourly rate. I believe Mr. Etheridge was under a retainer, um, and if you called him or didn't call him, you we paid a set fee. Yes. That, to, that uh, arrangement. To a point. And then yes. if it was litigation, no, if it's going to cost yeah. right. too much, then it went. So on what's happening hourly. here is that we're what we're contemplating is having a retainer arrangement for just the general day-to-day -day things, but using a normal fee structure like with most firms for the. The collective bargaining. Right, but what you originally said, oh, okay. Yeah. So when you originally said that this didn't include for negotiations, I thought you meant that we wouldn't be using this law firm to help us with negotiations. No. no. Negotiations are three years out, mm -hmm. well, and I mean, negotiations would not be covered under the retainer. So if indeed you're going to be using them for negotiations, then you need to recognize that that is a different fee structure, yeah. as would any litigation not be covered under a retainer. When the time comes to negotiate and to need, or to, mm -hmm. to need assistance, and, and this time we did it without lawyers at the table, but mm -hmm. we certainly needed assistance in writing up the agreement. Mm -hmm. is, is there any understanding that 
about who, which firm we would go to for that? Would it, is the assumption that we would go to um, Sullivan, Hayes, and Quinn for our negotiation strategy assistance that as well? That would be my assumption, mm -hmm. yeah. Assumption? Yes. That would be my assumption, That's yeah. That's correct. And they serve as counsel to many school committees in Western Mass, um, Chicopee, Holyoke, Westfield. Um, uh, we, we checked their references and, and, um, and looked at the list of roster of clients that they serve. Um, that was one of the things we did throughout the interviews with all of our folks. So they're very experienced in education law. Other questions? Oh, Mrs. Minnick. This is, this is kind of a touchy one, but is there any concern that, um, I'm, I'm trying to think how to say this appropriately, and, and um, that familiarity with negotiations, particularly collective bargaining with, in other districts, is a disadvantage to Northampton in having that same attorney represent us in negotiations? Actually, it's a tremendous advantage. Uh, because the, this firm and uh, the people within it will provide to negotiation teams all the information that they have at their fingertips with regard to what's happening in all the districts that they're also representing as well as others. So um, I see it as an advantage, uh, but that would be true of the other firm as well. I mean, the other firms serve other districts as well, right. so they all, they all serve multiple exactly. districts. Yeah. Other questions? Welcome, Mr. Meyer. Any other questions related to this? Okay, so there's a motion on the table um, regarding uh, the recommendation uh, put forth for uh, legal services. Um, and again, as I understand it, if adopted, the superintendent would then uh, work to put together a contract that would then be brought to the school committee uh -huh. for December, its yeah. for its approve, ultimate approval. Yeah. And once again, this is a three-year uh -huh. retainer agreement. Is Correct. there a three-year contract? So we're committed yeah. for three years. That is correct, yeah. Unanimous. Okay, so um, any other questions or discussion? Okay. Um, hearing the, none, all those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All those opposed? No. Abstain. Okay. So, abstaining. Okay. So uh, we have uh, two abstentions and one no vote. So the motion carries. Uh, okay. So the next item on the agenda is um, another required vote. <coughs> this concerns a retirement notification waiver uh, for a former uh, now retired employee, and I will ask the superintendent to present. One. Excuse me. One. Oh, excuse me. Yes, I I, I did accept. I, I did skip one item. Um, so there is a there is a vote um, that had been scheduled uh, to accept a gift um, from Vote Yes Northampton. Although in um, conferring with the treasurer, the city treasurer, uh, and looking, and he in turn spoke with the Office of Campaign and Political Finance and determined that um, the. Uh, According to a residual funds memo uh, that allows for how the dissolution of a campaign finance account can be used, um, that they can uh, flow to either the general fund of a municipality, the commonwealth, a charity, or a scholarship. So in fact, the school committee cannot accept it as a gift. Um, so it'll basically have to go to the general fund of the city, um, and then we can figure out a way to divide it uh, uh, among the school committee. So it's just, it's, we found out after the fact that it's not appropriate for the school committee to accept these kinds of funds. Um, they can only be given to the general fund. So, um, so that item we won't take up this evening. Um, the next, then we will come now to the next I have a item. Question on that. I mean, we're not taking up, but can I, I, I don't sure. understand. Um, we have scholarships 
through our, do we have scholarships? But we're not a scholarship organization. So, so if they had wanted to give it to dollars for scholars, they could do that. Um, so are we going to give it to the city or are we going to send it back to them and tell them that we could give it? I mean, because maybe already they don't understand. We've already alerted it oh, yeah, them and them. they want, their intention had been to give half to the city and half to the school department. Right. Um, it's, this is just the vehicle for that happening. Um, it has to come through the city first. Do you think it's still going to come back to us as they wished? I mean, half that's it, yes, our, half that that's our intention, yes. Okay. Well, I was just wondering because, I mean, the school committee doesn't accept all gifts, and I was just wondering if this was actually going to come back. But we can't say where it's going to go. Uh, I, I, we're going to do our best to carry out the wishes of vote yes, Northampton. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so then we are on to the next item, uh, which is a discussion of a retirement notification waiver. And I'll turn right. it over to the superintendent. There's a um, memo in your packet. Basically, we have a um, long-term teacher in Northampton. She's been with us almost 20 years. She retired as of September 13th of this year. Um, she submitted her letter of retirement on um, July, uh, I'm sorry, on January 30th of 2013. <coughs> by contract in order to receive her sick leave buyback a letter needed to have been submitted by January 15th, so she missed it by 15 days. However, the contract does stipulate that the school committee may waive that requirement. Um, this person has respectfully requested uh, the school committee uh, if they would consider waiving the requirement in order to allow her to receive the appropriate sick leave buyback. Uh, I support this request in light of the number of years of loyal service of the person involved um, and also the fact that for um, at least a few years, we've not reprinted contracts um, in Northampton. And I think that there has been sort of amendments that have been added and sort of put here and there in other ways. And I think it indeed um, might be possible that indeed um, the date was missed. So I would hope that the board would indeed um, approve for Denise Johnson, who is a speech language pathologist, um, the waiver requested so that she could indeed receive the appropriate sick leave buyback. So you need a motion? Mrs. Minnick. Oh, well, if you would like to make a motion. Um, uh, move okay. approval yeah. to waive the requirement as presented. Okay. okay. I'm sorry. I, th I thought you had a question. Okay. So the motion has been made and seconded. Are there any questions or comments? Um, I'm not going to raise my hand. Mr. Meyer. I thought that this was one of the provisions <laughs> that was amended in our new contract. I looked at the new contract and it does have that wording. I thought so too. And yeah. when this came up at the agenda meeting, I thought it had been amended too, yes. but it was not in the new well, contract. Um, but the new contract are, so the new contracts were produced by the association. Have they been printed? Have they been printed yet? No. So, so we're there finishing, are, we're still working on the dollar amounts. So there are in fact no new contracts, which means that we should look at the memorandum of agreement that we executed. I'm, I'm fairly certain that to, in order to avoid this, that we amended, and I could pull up the MOA, we amended it to say that the superintendent approved with right of appeal if denied to the school committee. Mm -hmm. Because we had precisely this situation where I think the mayor remembers where we tried to hold an executive or planned to hold an executive yeah. session. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy to, to vote for it's just in case. that's not necessary, but I, I guess we should probably look at the memorandum and try to. I'd be happy to approve it. <laughs> so <laughs> sure. either way. Right, right either this way. So maybe either way, do it as a vote here and if it's my. It could be a backup just in case. But I did, exactly. I mean, we did look at the contract language that we mm -hmm. had because I was surprised to see that we were going yeah. through this process right. again. Um, I mean, you know, and the, just a point of a clarification too. The reason that we have that, uh, or we had that language in there, was uh, for the purpose of budgeting for the for the next fiscal year, and uh -huh. to give the business manager and superintendent enough right. time to right. work in that fund uh, exactly. that number, so that um, we could build a budget with with that in mind. So, okay. it in this case, it really hasn't uh, detrimentally affected our budget. <laughs> I have to add an addendum to that because it's actually also the city that needs to budget because we pay the sick leave by that. <laughs> <laughs> so, to approve these things, it's, 
easy because they're not coming out of the school budget. So I have to also say it is important to have a to have a little bit of a notice so that we can plan for them. Right. So, but in this case, obviously, it was 15 days, mm -hmm. so it was not egregious. Well, I just wanted to, um, you know, commend the interim interim superintendent for supporting this, and um, I don't think that we should be so. I mean, we're dealing with people's lives. I think whenever we can be flexible to people who give so much anyway, that we should. So thank you. But I also have to say, again, another editorial mm -hmm. comment. You that need that part time. of what we do as, as educators is we teach children about deadlines and we teach people about um, those kinds of issues. So I also think it's important that people respect those things as well. So, especially employment contracts. So, my own, again, editorial comment. I agree. I think there were some circumstances mm -hmm. that led to this situation. Exactly. Yeah, I doubt she did it on purpose. Okay, like, like you know, the moose hit my car. You know, excuses like that. Yeah, those kinds of excuses it exist. <laughs> Gloves are off. The voters, the voters spoke. <laughs> <laughs> How many um, okay, so uh, where are we? Okay, so there's been a motion made and seconded. Um, all those in favor, uh, say aye. 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 Um, opposed? Aye. Any abstentions? Okay, so that's approved. Um, <coughs> whether it needs it or not, it's approved. Um, the next item on the agenda is the business manager's report. Okay, hopefully in your package you have the uh, manager's report. Um, just to recap a couple of things, just uh, one noteworthy item is the Capital Planning Committee still continues to review all the city proposals, as well as our technology uh, proposal for the third part of the 300000 for uh, completing our technology plan so we can continue to upgrade our schools. Um, under contracts, the hydrotech engineering uh, is to repair that storm drain uh, system piping where there was that large sinkhole at the, uh, in the high school parking lot. That's moving forward. That is under cost. The original cost was much higher. Um, there's some significant savings there. That is a capital expenditure number. Uh, the second one is a eutactic software, which is a special education IEP writing, tracking, development, managing of student software for the special education department. Also in your packet, you have the monthly, and I'll say the, the monthly financial statement uh, going through October 31st. Uh, the report captures all your expenses that have been paid through the first four months of the year, July through October. Uh, and as you can see, uh, we are doing <coughs> very well up, you know, through this point. Um, if you were to average it and divide it out, we should be spending at about a 34% uh, level overall. We are at a, just about 28% spent. So um, we're in a good position right now in our monthly spending. Even though there's some accounts that are spent more than others, the overall is what I'm tracking here for you to keep us on track and know where we're headed for the year. Um, capital planning. Our next uh, capital planning uh, meeting will be November 20th, where the committee will be getting together to prioritize all the uh, capital projects that have been submitted. Mr. Sahowski and myself sit on that committee, so we will be looking at those projects as submitted and prioritizing those uh, for the mayor. Also, uh, Tonight, there is a hard copy on your desk. It says the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. It says FY13 end of year financial report. Uh, this book. This is the same type of report that you've seen in prior years. Um, this report uh, presents all the financials and puts them in a DOE accounting structure and the codes that the Department of Education uses. Um, this report is no different than other reports that are used in all the other districts in the state. This records our <coughs> revenues, our expenses, our grants, any other funding. Um, and as you see, there's lots of little places to put monies and track monies in here. 
the Department of Ed in some cases combines categories and in other cases asks us to break out certain categories of expenses. Um, this report, the primary purpose of it is to be used uh, as the basis when they calculate our Chapter 70 funding. They take this report along with the, the same report from other districts and do their comparison and they do uh, their analysis based on how our numbers are reported. And uh, this is the primary document that supports our Chapter 70 funding, which is about $7 million is what we get from the state. The biggest uh, purpose is information to the Department of Ed. They want to know how we're spending our money. So this report here takes all of our financial reports at various different levels and puts it into categories that the, the Department of Ed can make comparisons from one district to another, whether it's state aid, whether it's teacher spending, whether it's professional development, uh, anything like that. It, it makes a standardized comparison from district to district. As you can see, the report is very complicated, it's intricate, and uh, there are multiple sources of information that's used to supply the Department of Ed uh, with the numbers and in these different categories. And it takes a really long time to put this report together. Uh, uh, let me see here. Um, it, this report has been submitted, and the final stage of this report right now is uh, as part of the end of the year package that normally gets submitted. Uh, the last formal requirement for the Department of Ed is to obtain the necessary signatures from the superintendent, uh, the school committee chair, and the city auditor. And of course, I'm on this report as the preparer uh, of this report for the Department of Ed. Um, so if there are any questions that I can ask, or you can ask, or maybe I can answer, um, there's a lot of information there. Um, I'll see if I can. Like next year, give us the executive summary. <laughs> this is just a lot of the, the, a lot of stuff here. Okay. I will. <laughs> so I have a question. Sure. So this report is used okay. for calculate <coughs> Chapter 70 funds. It's used to support their the way they look at it and divvy up the monies. Yes. Okay. And so when they're doing it, they're taking information out of it, so that they're essentially comparing apples to apples. Correct. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. They are also using it to verify whether, in fact, we've met our minimum local contribution as that, well. Yes. That's the other factor, or net school spending, as it's commonly referred to. And, and in one of the final pages in the report, we are over our net school spending, which means we are putting more into education than what the state requires us to put in. When they set the formula in 1980, whatever it was. Or, 1982? Yeah. Does that affect how much we get back? I mean, if we put in more, does that affect what they're going to give us? All of this has an impact. I don't know what, what priority or how much that impacts what we receive from the Department of Ed. I do not know how they use that in their determination of the Chapter 70 funds. Well, because some places, if you don't use all your money, then the next year they don't out a lot as much money. So I was just wondering if this had any repercussions well, to us if I don't we know have if too much. I don't know if that's the same logic, because there are some schools that are under net school spending, and right. there are a lot of schools that are over. Okay. So it, it runs the gamut. Is it possible to do just kind of a, a report, you know, presentation that says this is what we're looking at with, so that it's simpler than this in any way? Or is this really just, this, it's a cal complicated this calculation? The, this is the real report. I mean, I right. summarized this down and uh, squeeze out a couple of pages here for you. But I just wanted to also, so you can see the detail mm -hmm. in the scrutiny that is looked at when we he are. spent the last three months on this thing. Yeah. I think he deserves a pat hard. on the back, at least. But, but it is a lot of uh, birdcake shiner or whatever. <laughs> I Any other I questions? Think, I think executive summary is all around, except for Danny, and he would like to get the full thing. Um, I just have a question a on mind. payments to other districts. So I'm looking <laughs> at line four, beginning with 458. Mm -hmm. 
same the bottom. Column, uh, yeah, that first yeah, one. Yeah. Mr. Right. Three of three. Oh. They all say that. It's uh, actually cell is line 770. Yes. So, so I wonder if you could just walk me through these components of payments to other districts. And then when I flip to the next, so, so if you could just walk me through this. All right, let What's, me walk you through that first. We had a student on that particular line uh, attend uh, Chicopee uh, Vocational School mm -hmm. in which we did not provide, we did not have a program here at Smith Voc, so a student had opted uh, under the law and could attend the Chicopee School, so I have to record that as that expenditure as a tuition to another mass school. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you go down to line, I think it's uh, 463, these are the tuitions to our non-public schools, and this represents um, private schools out of district, primarily special education. And any collaborative tuitions in the line just below that, um, that represents any collaborative tuitions that are paid to Hampshire Collaborative, Lower Pioneer Collaborative, and any other uh, again, special education tuitions where programs are provided that we send our children to. And so these, so these would be programming or expenditures where the IEP cannot be satisfied with programs we can provide within the district. Correct. Okay. So then, flipping to the next page, I've, you've got payments to other districts again, and there's tuition to mass again at line tuition to mass schools. How and why is that different than the previous page that I looked at? I, I see that we've got now regular, you know, the column regular day and special education are both included, but I've got 3455 there. There, there is, that is just for special education. That was a, I don't know which program that was for, but um, that was the, that's just for special education. Okay. And, and school choice tuition um, is that it's broken down into regular day and special education. If is that because a student who is receiving has an IEP and receives services is going to fall into the column special education, or is that the portion of cost that's being picked up by the district? There is a breakout of what that is. There's a, there's a minimal breakout for school choice tuition. And then there's incremental increases over that baseline that determines uh, that is determined by the IEPs. So um, the incremental difference beyond a basic choice tuition, where somebody is uh, choosing, that uh, incremental change is as a result of special education need. Okay, and the, finally the um, the charter school numbers there. So. Charter school tuition typically is deducted or it's dealt with in the cherry sheet? Yes. And so if I'm looking at these numbers, they're, they're actually tracking numbers that are coming off the cherry sheet? They're not, there's not cherry a Cherry sheet numbers for the charter come off first. Okay. And that's a separate number altogether. That is not uh, the chart. Um, th those are coming off first, but I have to record those here as part of our expenses. Okay, so so I wouldn't be looking at, they're not two separate numbers. The, the, I understand that cherry sheet numbers are taken off even before the money right. Right, reaches the city. But, but you have to record them here as if they were part of the budget, even though they're not dealt with that way. They're dealt with because they're taken off first. The Department of Ed wants us to include them right. because they're part of the overall educational process. Expenditures. Whether it's a choice, whether it's a charter, whether it's private, you know, they want us to account for all the funds. That's why when you look farther back on some of the other schedules uh, on this report, the numbers of our budget will jump up to 38 million and 40 million because the Department of Ed includes other items that we don't necessarily manage on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you. Other questions about the um, end of your report, which for those watching at home, I believe will be available on the, all of them are available on the DOR, on the, the DOE website, It'll rather. Be, yes, it will be. The Department of Ed will go through as soon as they validate it's not available. 
I, I just wanted to say thank you very, very much for a job probably very well done. If I could understand it all, I'm sure it is. It looks great. Thank so you. thank you. Any other questions for the business manager? Okay. Hearing none, we want to move on to the personnel report. Packet, there should be a one page personnel report. Uh, you can see the. You can see the uh, 12 new hires uh, that have uh, been hired in the month of October, and uh, there has been uh, five separations uh, in the month, no retirements. And uh, two staff members have taken on uh, new duties and responsibilities and promotions. Okay, are there any questions regarding the personnel report? Okay, hearing none, uh, we will now move on to the next item. Uh, this concerns a discussion um, regarding the interim superintendent position. Um, as, uh, I don't know if you want to about explain or um, obviously <coughs> the current interim superintendent has indicated um, her intention to uh, to stay through to January but to assist us in identifying a new um, interim superintendent to finish out the school year um, and uh, it's my intent as before uh, to appoint a small committee of school committee members to work Superintendent Nash uh, to go ahead and uh, and advertise and interview, um, and I would to that end I would appoint uh, the vice chair as well as Mrs. Minnick, who served on that in that capacity the last time that we um, we worked on this. So, do you have any um, any information to convey on this particular item? Well, a, a couple of things. First of all, I want to make sure that people understand it's not out of uh, unhappiness. Um, that I've really enjoyed working with all the people I've, I've found here. Everyone's been very welcome. Um, and I, I feel that I was retired for 22 days, and I kind of like to revisit the idea of being retired. So um, we have advertised for um, an interim superintendent to carry you from January 2nd to June 30th. Um, it's been posted, and um, I sort of have a, 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 an idea of a timeline. Um, we put a deadline date of uh, November 22nd, looking to do interviews, uh, depending upon Ed and Lisa's schedule for um, Monday, December 9th and or Tuesday, December 10th, um, with a recommendation going to the school committee at your next meeting, which is December 12th, uh, and then a general announcement on the following day on Friday the 13th. Ooh, I shouldn't have said that. Just <laughs> <laughs> um, a I do want to emphasize that there's no way that I'm leaving you high and dry, and if it takes a few more days to get things in place, then that's fine. Um, but I really um, just want to say what if actually it's been fun. Um, so we'll see where that goes, and hopefully we'll find you um, someone that can meet your needs for the rest of the year. Excellent. Thank you. Well. Uh, we appreciate the, the service that you've given to the district and will continue to give. And um, so that position's been advertised, um, and, uh, and uh, we will begin reviewing those applications and setting up that process. So um, thank you. Uh, I, I don't know, does the, uh, are there any questions about that process, or um, does anyone feel that the committee needs to make any sort of formal motion regarding the process that we've set in place? Um, or are we comfortable uh, with it as it's been outlined by the superintendent? Okay, I'll take the, oh, this is Minnick. I have only one question and that is um, whether the committee would consider uh, someone, <laughs> I don't even know how, I'm, I'm sorry. In, in some instances, it has been practiced not to have someone serve in an interim position if that person would be intending to apply for or would be considered for the permanent position. And I guess I'm asking if um, that would be, if what the committee's 
feeling is about that so that we're sure it may be that the people who are applying for the interim position are people who are not interested in the permanent position but just on the off chance that it is I would just like to know how the committee feels about that that's a good question um, I believe correct me if I'm wrong I believe for the this current um, interim superintendency that was a stipulation that someone would not be a candidate for the permanent position <clears throat> does anyone have any thoughts on that or questions about that Okay. Okay. What's the what's the rationale for the stipulation? Coming an inside track. Um, well, there's that, and also that we frequently have whoever is the interim superintendent is in many ways running the um, running the process for the hiring of the next superintendent. So it's it's not only sort of an inside track, but it's also again sort of, it's a, it can be it creates an awkward situation. At I will least. say I think in West Springfield their current superintendent was an acting superintendent and uh, he's I mean everybody loves him he's great and he was acting and then he I mean that's the I other side of the coin is that it gives you the, it's it gives fantastic you the opportunity I mean, to see I, guess that's, uh, I know that um, one of our former staff went to a district as an acting uh, um, and applied for the position uh, as well was allowed to apply for the position didn't get the position uh -huh. but I know that that so it's not uncommon but I, I mean, it, it this has been the both rationale ways. the good you know one side you get to see the person in action the other side is that it can create problems if the person isn't selected and has to particularly if it's an internal candidate and then it goes back into you know so there are just I, I just wanted to know what the committee I'd if the committee so wanted to instruct the are. subcommittee how to do it I think you've outlined very clearly that it works both ways and it really is the comfort level of the committee um, I have to say that the few that we have who have already indicated an interest um, I do not see that they would be uh, candidates for the position but it's still open and you don't know there may be some people who would apply hoping to parley it into a full-time position so it's really up to the community. I always think uh, when we do, we put constraints on things like this that we're limiting ourselves. Um, and I think just because someone who um, is interested in the position applies doesn't mean they need to be selected as the interim. But um, I hate to, s to not take on a really good interim just because they're also interested in the district. That may be the candidate we, we actually want. And, and it does work both ways. And you can also get someone as the interim who's horrible and and you know then wow I'm you know but they go through and for the final position we know we don't want them and that's fine too but I don't want to I'd hate to see us have this arbitrary sti stipulation and then lose a candidate that could be a good one we're not locked into taking them yeah, just because I they I agree with Mike but, but, oh, I'm sorry. I would say anything you we put out there it can be characterized as an arbitrary stipulation right so you know it's kind of like one plus one I would say that, that if we say that the interim is someone who is eligible for the permanent position, I would worry that that may deplete the pool of people who weren't the interim, who may be looking at the district and think, oh, well, that person's going to have an inside track. And I know that one of the things that we have struggled with is the idea that we haven't gotten a big enough pool of candidates. So I just want to throw that out there. just thinking the same thing. And Mr. Yeah. Moore? No, yeah, I was going to say that I think it's far from arbitrary. I think it, there's really some good reasons for it. it and one of, one of them is that the process is, is much more limited in terms of public input and um, looking at the person. And, and, then, and then by getting there, once they are the interim superintendent, it's an incumbent advantage, which, they, which then, so you then apply the full process with the public looking at them and things. But it's, but, it, but you've already, without that process, essentially given an advantage in that process. And so I think it's, um, I think for both reasons, both in terms of the, the quality of the pool and also in terms of really, if, if, we, if we value the process that we have for our permanent superintendent, and I think we do value it and we can certainly improve it, um, we really need to recognize that when you do an interim superintendent search using much less of the process, you, you are, in a sense, undermining your, what you, you say you value. 
Mr. Bourne. Yeah, I would just say, I mean, they only have the inside track if we want them to have the inside track. I mean, if they're stellar and we want them to be considered, then we consider them. And, but I don't know. I, I mean, I think the school committee is smart enough to find somebody good, and the more candidates we have, the better. So. <laughs> Okay, so it sounds like we've got some divergent views here. Um, uh, I don't know whether. Uh, yeah. So it sounds like we may want to have some clar a vote to clarify where everybody comes down on this. Mm. Um, so, I, I guess I'm curious. What is our default right now? How was the position advertised a certain way? When we, we I'm assuming we used the advertisement from before. We did. Um, when, uh, so I don't know if it says uh, anything, if it stipulates that. No, okay. it does not so stipulate currently, that. Yeah, the, it doesn't stipulate it. Mm -mm. Um, so, so, so therefore, if we were to make a decision to not have an interim also be a candidate for, for permanent, we would have to go back to anybody who applies and make sure that they understood that in case they wanted to withdraw their application to be an, inter an interim. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a small, small enough pool so far. So, right. so right now, what's advertised? There's no stipulation regarding your el future eligibility to apply for the full-time position. So, Mr. Flynn, I just want to add, like, so one other way to look at this is, what if you get an interim right now, and uh, who just was thinking I'll fill in this position, and is a great fit, and we love them, and they love the district, but. We've put the stipulation in, so now they're ineligible to apply, and we can't do anything about that. Like, so I mean, there's just like even if they're like already on track to get here. So I just feel like um, I trust the leadership uh, in the district to be able to to and, and anyone who serves on the committee to to look at these candidates and say, yeah, this person would be a good fit. And I don't want to limit our. I mean, an, an interim is is just as important, or or pretty close to as important as the final one. This is someone who's going to be here for a while and our district still needs to be in good hands and I just feel like if we if we put on any kind of constraint on the process then we may have to turn down a candidate that could be a good fit and I just I'd like to leave it to the people who are doing the interviews and meeting with candidates to to be able to have as much flexibility as possible and and with us being this far removed from the process I don't want us to, to put any uh, barriers up. Um, I agree with Mike, and I think, I mean, I also trust them enough that if there really was an issue and they felt that there was an issue, I think that they would probably bring it back to us. I mean, that's also an option, too. Um, I would hate to, to, to put somebody out that we could have to lose a potential. So I do agree with Mike. But, I mean, if there was an issue, they could always bring it and say, look, this is the issue, and they didn't have to decide it all by themselves. They can still ask us all. Okay. Ms. Pick. I just had um, one other thought, just thinking out loud. So um, during the, the initial process when you're going for a permanent position, it is supposed to be confidential. And unless the interim superintendent were stating out loud that he or she was applying for the permanent position, that actually should not be known to the public or to anybody else who's applying. It really, I mean, it wouldn't be, unless that person divulges the information, him or herself, um, other candidates actually wouldn't be, shouldn't be aware of it until the finalists are announced. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Yeah. Now, granted, an interim could very well say, just letting everybody know, I'm applying. If, you know, if we had somebody really good, people would be going to that person saying, I hope you're applying, and they may or may not say yes. Okay, so um, I guess the question steps. really then is, right now it sounds like we've got a, the current posting doesn't make that stipulation, so I guess it's up to the committee if it wants to add that at this point, or instruct the search committee to add, to factor that yeah. in. Mr. I move that we leave the posting as is, okay. and not add a stipulation. Second. Saying that the application for the interim will disqualify that candidate from applying for the permanent position. So there's been a motion made and seconded um, to not put that stipulation in place. Is there any discussion or further discussion on that topic or on the motion? Okay. So um, did you get the motion? 
Well, we were discussing the superintendent, interim superintendent position, um, and this is just a clarification that we want to instruct the committee on. So I, I, I feel like we've advertised that we're going to be discussing this, and this is a point of clarification. So not I think something we're fine. that he could have reasonably <laughs> known I was going to ask. What's that? I said it's not something you could reason reasonably have known that well, I would. But I ask. also think it fits within the, <laughs> the parameters of, of trying to, to uh, put forward a new interim superintendent search. So. Never know what kind of off the wall. So. Um, all those in favor of Mr. Meyer's motion say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Nay. Okay, two nay. All those abstaining. Okay, so I believe the motion carries. Okay. Two nays. Okay, okay so um, so we uh, the, the committee will keep us apprised of the progress there. Uh, next is the superintendent's report. Okay. Um, I have a few items this evening to bring you up to date on. We had our professional development day on November 5th, and the district offered two um, professional development opportunities, one for teachers and one for our ESPs. The teachers had the opportunity to hear from Michael Morris, who's the director of assessment for the Amherst School District, and he was with us regarding the district determined measures, or as we know them, DDMs, for all of you who are in education. Um, DDMs are one of those measures that we use to determine student growth and um, hence teacher effectiveness as part of the new teacher evaluation system. Uh, each teacher will be evaluated using two DDMs, uh, one of which will be MCAS scores where that's appropriate and others have to be developed by teachers uh, within teams and or departments. So we were able to get a head start on that um, because we do have DDMs that are due by the end of June uh, to uh, Department of Education. And um, Mike was with us and did a great job, um, talked with us in the morning and then uh, teachers broke into groups for the rest of the day and he was able to go around to various groups and work with them in developing their DDMs. The ESPs were offered a variety of options, including uh, brain-based learning, behavior management skills, assessment, and technology, among others. And at the end of the day, uh, we were able to provide a performance by the Berkshire Hills Music Academy. Um, they're located in South Hadley, and this is a group of students who are exceptional musicians um, who have uh, learning difficulties. And it was uh, a very moving uh, performance. Um, I did attend with some other people. And um, I think it really brought home to us why it's so important that we educate all of our students. Um, because all of them have some talents. Um, may or may not be the ones that we're teaching in school, and it may be, but they are talented individuals. Uh, and it's important they receive the appropriate education. We heard many positive comments uh, on both of those programs that we sponsored, including um, the one said it's one of the best we've ever had, meaning the in-service day, and another one said it was very helpful, how helpful it was to work with Mike Morris um, with regard to the DDMs. Um, last Friday, November 8th, we had some curriculum mapping. Uh, John Bianchi, who's with the DSAC committee, he's their math specialist, he came here to work with 25 of our elementary math teachers and administrators, this is K through 6, uh, in curriculum mapping. And the focus of the workshop was locating materials to supplement our current math program, which is investigations, in order to meet the common core standards. He's returning on December 3rd to work with the same group of people to continue this work. We've also had two of our grants um, approved. Uh, Title I and Title IIA, uh, and we're in the process of increasing a reading teacher's time at Bridge Street School, hiring a reading teacher and a math interventionist at Leeds Elementary School, and increasing a reading and math teacher's time at Ryan Road uh, using grant funding. Um, I do want to say that uh, Nancy Cheevers has been a wonderful addition to our office. As you know, she's the Director of Curriculum Assessment, and one of the things she's doing is all of these grants. 
She had to first of all um, finish out the FY13 um, grants um, and close those out and then write the new ones for FY14. Um, and she's been really working very hard at doing that. And I also want to commend DESE, which I don't often do, um, but they've been terrific in working with her and helping her understand the process of what needs to be done. Um, substitutes, so um, basically if anyone's out there watching who has been interested in being a substitute, we really need you. We're running short. Um, and we've added to our own website information and the application process. Um, it would be really helpful if people want to work in our schools. Um, we could use your help. And today, um, I attended the annual legal issues workshop with attorney Regina Tate. Um, that's sponsored by the Collaborative for Educational Services. is sponsored every year. And uh, attorney Tate brings us up to date both the IEP process and the 504 plans and all the changes that have happened either um, because of uh, um, changes at legislative level and or um, court cases um, that have um, moved one way or another in terms of interpretation of some of the laws and regulations around those two areas. And I was happy to say that I had several of our administrators there with me um, because this is one of the areas they really need to be up to date on. And it's local um, and it's always well done. So there were about 120 people uh, as there normally is uh, each year at the workshop. So those are the areas that I wanted to report on. If you have any questions, I'll try to answer them. Okay, are there any questions or comments regarding the superintendent's report? Okay, um, hearing none, uh, the next item that's scheduled on our agenda um, regards the uh, superintendent uh, and, the, and a, opening a new search process for um, a superintendent following uh, the school committee's decision uh, last month not to hire any of the finalists. Um, I can update you that um, NESDEC um, has agreed uh, to uh, redo the superintendent search process um, at no cost other than the expenses. Um, uh, there would be a slight change in, the, uh, f in terms of the makeup of who we would be working with. Uh, we would now be working with a three-person team um, consisting of Dr. Arthur Betancourt, who's the executive director of NASDAQ, uh, Dr. Carolyn Burke, um, and Dr. William Erickson. Um, and so they would be the three-person team that would be uh, overseeing this search. Um, and they are prepared uh, representative to come to our next meeting um, to discuss uh, a new process and go over sort of any of the issues um, that the committee has. Um, I know the superintendent, um, um, Superintendent Nash, has made some recommendations that I wanted to discuss with you this evening um, regarding uh, language in the posting as well as um, as well as salary uh, recommendations that I think we want to discuss. Um, and then I want to get your input um, in terms of um, putting together a new committee uh, moving forward with this process. Um, and uh, so I guess, I, do you have anything to add in terms of uh, that information? No, just in talking with um, Dr. Betancourt, he mm -hmm. would look forward to working with the committee. Your December 12th meeting. Okay. Um, Excellent. Mm -hmm. So, in terms of the actual um, posting, which we would need to um, have NESDEC go out. Yes, Mr. I just want to ask a question about the three person approach. Is that what they're, is this a new approach that they're moving towards? Is all the districts that they're doing searches for? Is this no. something they're just doing with Northampton for a certain reason? Or, or what? It's one I requested. What's the I know, I know personally um, Art Betancourt. Uh, I think highly of him. He's been executive director there for about three years. And I think it would be good to have him um, sort of honcho the process that you're going through. Uh, um, and I think that um, Carolyn Burke um, is 
<clears throat> a wonderful consultant. She's not worked in this area before, and I think teaming her with Bill Erickson, who knows this area, and um, both of them, I think, would be very good in recruiting. So I think a three-team approach would be um, a positive move, and I spoke to Art about that, and he agreed. Great. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Other questions about that? Okay. So in terms of the actual job posting, um, I know that the superintendent had discussed some potential, uh, uh, one potential language change, because I know that there was some discussion um, throughout mm -hmm. the last process regarding um, whether or not uh, experience level, uh, whether we wanted someone who had been a superintendent, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the language change that uh, Superintendent Nash had recommended for the posting uh, was, this, was the line, uh, superintendent experience preferred but not required, um, is something we may add to, uh, to sort of express that. <coughs> and going back to our earlier conversation, not necessarily limit the pool to someone who has only been a superintendent, but to at least express a preference for that. So I wanted to open that up as a possible, as a discussion item to see where, what people felt about that. I think it's great uh, for the same reason we stated earlier about not limiting um, our choices. I think um, there are people who have superintendent experience who shouldn't be superintendents, and there. And I'm just being honest. I mean, it's um, it, it, any leader. We know that there are people who, who had experience at it and aren't necessarily good at it, and um, and they move around from district to district sometimes, and um, and so just having that former title or having that title under their belt doesn't necessarily make them a great leader. And on the other end. There are people who are naturally gifted educational leaders who are just needing that opportunity and that, um, and so by having a, stating a preference, because clearly someone with experience who, who obviously comes with recommendations and uh, is is pref uh, preferable, but I I would hate to have us limit ourselves by by saying it has to be someone with superintendent ex experience. Okay, so I think the language was designed to kind of at least address the concern that had been raised in the process, but, but not, again, not limit ourselves to that, but just express it would be preferable but not required. I, I don't have it in front of me, but I don't think our, our profile actually, or, or um, not the profile, the, what is it that's doing the job enhancement? Does it specify that somebody has to have um, um, supervisory experience or um, any, I mean, any kind of administrative leadership experience? Yes, it does. I don't have it in front of me, but I'm, so I'm relying on. Uh, I'm not familiar yeah. with the posting the way yeah. I am. Mm -hmm. well, I it also it seems like it. that they would know that. I mean, if, if they were applying for that job, they would probably need to have that. And if not, <coughs> they kind of mm -hmm. scoot them out anyway. You wouldn't scoot them out? No administrative or. or I mean, I would just they wouldn't, they, would. they wouldn't make the cut. They wouldn't. Yeah. So, um, so did, did you, it was, uh, answer the question, okay. Um, and then the other item, in terms of the salary posting that had came up during our prior uh, process was the issue of salary. Um, I believe we actually did not specify a salary in the last posting. Um, we had sort of a, I think we had an, a range that we had in mind. We but gave I, a range to our NESDA consultant who did share that with the candidates. Okay. So the candidates were shared they the did range, that, yes. which was 120 to 140. Correct. Exactly. So I know that became a question mark um, at the end of the last process. And so um, one of the, rec the, the recommendation uh, that uh, is before you is to consider whether or not to um, increasing and tightening that range uh, to 140 to 150,000 um, as a as a possible range to advertise, and that's based on looking at surrounding districts, okay. looking at the leadership okay. of comparable school districts, um, mm -hmm. to try to be more in line with those. And I think we also have to be mindful that someone cited a figure to me today. 
how many superintendencies are vacant. Mm -hmm. uh, 40. So it's, a, yes, it's in excess of 40 that will be coming vacant this school year. So presumably 40, it'll be a, a... 40 in Massachusetts? Yes. Oh, yeah. Each year for the last several years. Yeah. So it will yeah. be a competitive, potentially competitive process. So, mm -hmm. so, um, so that's another discussion point that I wanted to get guidance um, and, and have a vote on as well uh, when we complete our discussion. Yes. Um, to address that, uh, currently we're at what, 120 to 140? Correct. And um, what's the rationale for going to just keep it at a $10,000? 10, $10, I mean, why wouldn't we go 130 to 150? Why are we deciding to go 140 to 150? That was part of it. And then the other part was um, I went away um, these past few days to the Massachusetts Association of School Committees, and I spoke with different superintendents. and. Um, they did most of them, and I would say 90% of them, because some said that the salary was fine and didn't shouldn't really matter in different areas. But most of them did say that um, that 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 they figured that that was a very low salary to be able to get anybody um, during this highly competitive time. Because at the time, the person was aware that there were 26 currently open and that they were going to be upward to 50. That's what I heard this weekend. Okay. Please, yes. Um, I spent a long time um, being an educator and 20 years being a superintendent, 12 of them locally. I've talked with a number of people, both current superintendents, previous superintendents, headhunters, um, and people in general who know the educational field. And I really think, based on those conversations and based on what I know, that if you advertise at 140 to 150, you're going to find some people that you would be happy to have as your superintendent. Uh, with or without superintendent experience, this is a district that you've got 2,700 students, you've got 550 employees, you're tied to a city, you have a large school committee, you have a variety of students with specific needs that are all different from each other. And it's a complex system, not necessarily complicated and certainly not doable. And in fact, if I were 10 years younger, I'd be applying for the job because you have a charm about Northampton and you have wonderful people who are working here. And what they need and what they really want is educational leadership from the top down. And I really am convinced that you need to offer this sort of money to get that quality. And when you offer something lesser than that, I think a lot of times you buy yourselves more problems that will cost you more money in the end result. I, I do think that this allows you to be competitive with someone perhaps a little more central or eastern side of the state who wants to get out of the, the mad rush and back to um, something more calming and a place to raise children, which Northampton would be wonderful. Um, I don't think they're going to take lesser <coughs> salary, but they might take an equal salary. Um, I think you also would be attractive to perhaps retired superintendents from a surrounding state, perhaps who were originally in Massachusetts, who you know, might be in their early 50s, want a second career. Uh, in Massachusetts. I think this would put you uh, in that area. But when you look at just local school districts such as Amherst, South Hadley, they're your neighbors, um, they're paying close to 150. And these are not um, in either of those veteran superintendents. Um, they are people with 10, 12 years experience. Um, in one case, a little bit less than another. So I don't think it's unreasonable, and I think you need to look at what you have here, what you want to maintain, and the fact that you want to continually get better at what you're doing. And you have a wonderful program. So I do think that that's the most reasonable rate that I think you can really solicit the type of people who you deserve. Thank you. Mr. Bourne. Yeah, I mean, as I've said before, I mean, one of our most important roles is to um, hire an exceptional chief executive. So, I mean, I think if we're talking about twenty or ten or twenty thousand extra a year, I think that could be money incredibly well spent. Um, in terms of um, why not make it thirty to fifty, I think it's because it kind of sends a message. We'll probably end up around forty, right? So, I think 
40 to 50 kind of sends a different message. And I mean, I would just make a motion to set it 40 to 50, 140 to 150. I'll second his motion. Okay. Um, could I ask you to, uh, sure, that's fine. I, I um, that's fine. Uh, we'll get back to the language. We didn't right. actually vote on the language piece. Okay. Um, actually, we, no, we didn't, because I was thinking of your motion, but that was before. But we'll get back to that. So comment on that. Did you have a question? Uh, no, I have a comment. Um, first of all, there's a difference between our determining what we think is an appropriate salary and actually advertising a salary. It would be my preference still not to put a, a salary or even a salary range in the posting for the position. And having heard the superintendent say that she felt that that was in some manner a way of soliciting the right people. I also do think that, as we discussed earlier, it's also a way of limiting the people that we who might apply. And so I would prefer to just have the posting, the announcement for the position, you know, say salary commensurate with experience or salary, um, you know, comparable to the, the area or whatever so that it's vague enough that we aren't committed. And I think that we could then have our discussion about what's the appropriate salary range. And um, in some cases, we have had discussions regarding salaries and salary ranges in executive session. And I think that, I, I wonder if that would be an appropriate venue for discussing this. If not, then, uh, it, you know, it's, um, and you're saying it's not. I see heads shaking. No, no, no. If you were renegotiating a contract with an existing administrator, you could certainly go into an executive session, but it's not really talking about a job posting. It's not really eligible for executive okay. session. All right. So then I, I guess what I would say is my preference would be not to list a salary range. Um, I also, but I also do understand, I, I'm, I have a little bit of concern that we want to attract the broadest pool of candidates possible. Some of those will be less experienced, some of them will be experienced, and some will be greatly experienced. And then uh, some of them will be coming from other areas where they're used to earning a higher salary and it and our salary will look low by comparison but this is rural western Massachusetts and so I'm I'm just really reluctant I so I think having said all of my concerns I think I probably will vote against Alden's motion specifically because I don't want it printed in the in the Announcement. Okay. Um, announcement. I guess, can I first yield to the maker of the motion to, if, if you have an additional question oh, I to for um, Dr. Nash? I mean, what's your, what's your take and what's an ESDEC's take on this? On what's the most effective way to find somebody? Do you put the number in the ad or do you not put the number in the ad? I can't speak for NESDEC. I honestly don't know. Um, I think it, it does two things. First of all, I think it gives reassurance to people perhaps who are on the low end of experience that the minimal I can get if I apply for this and get it is 140. Um, and I think that's reassuring to people who are starting <coughs> out and, and want to know something about that. I think it's also a way to, um, for people on, the, on, for instance, the eastern side of the state who are paying 225,000 salary for a superintendent, um, that they shouldn't apply. Mm -hmm. That as much as they would love living over on this side, um, 150 is about it. And I think that saves everyone's time. The other thing that will happen is, even if you don't post it, anyone who's going to apply for this job, you're going to get one of these consultants telling them what your range is. Mm -hmm. So I don't see any harm in actually putting it out there. I think it just solves, it solves a lot of problems for, for people who may be interested. So. Okay, Ms. Duvall, and then Ms. Um, I would agree that it saves people the time by putting it out there. But the other thing and the other is that anybody can look up and see what um, the previous superintendent was making and make assumptions from there and I think it would defeat the point because then they'd be looking back at the 131,000 which is where we're at. I think that we should just be upfront and transparent and put the whole thing out there and um, I think not to list the salary range would be a mistake. I think people should know 
that we have nothing to hide and that this is what we're looking for and if they feel that they 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 um you know are qualified then then we don't want to exclude them i just think that if we don't post it we may exclude people <coughs> just by people who look up and say well they were 131 no way are they going to go up another 10 or 20,000 so I think we should ask what we're looking for okay. Sorry. I think this pick and then Mr. Warren. so um, whatever our range is it's going to be known to NASDAQ and it's going to get shared so I mean I would take NASDAQ's advice about whether it's best to put that right in the ad knowing that the candidates can call NASDAQ and get the information um, m my question is is about s starting at 140 so um, I, I don't I don't want to be swayed by what Amherst does um, they, they've made decisions all along that aren't the same kinds of decisions that we would make and that's that's fine um, I, I, I think that starting our range at 120 did not help us. I don't think that was a good place to start, and we never intended to pay 120 when we were already at 130 or 131. Um, but I'm, uh, I would rather see us start a little bit lower than 140 and have, and have the opportunity to have more of a discussion about where somebody that we, li you know, that we might be considering falls. Um, and I'm not sure whether that would be 130 to 135. I mean, I, I, I don't think we're going to start at 130 since we were already over that, so I think we should be honest about that. But I think I'd like to have us have a little bit more of more than a $10,000 range. I'd like to see it maybe be 135 to 150. And, and frankly, the, the 150 makes, I mean, I, we haven't asked our business manager yet, but I, I don't know exactly, you know, how this is, where this is coming from and how that's going to impact the rest of our budget and our negotiations with the rest of our administrators and it's like you, you can't just raise the top and not think that there are going to be aren't going to be repercussions i don't think we've had that piece of the discussion yet so yes i do think that we need to raise our salary i'm just a little bit concerned at 140 to 150 makes me a little bit more nervous than starting at 135 um i, I don't want it to be assumed that we're going to go to the top of that for the average candidate Mr. Bourne. So, I mean, 135 versus 140, it's an extra $100 a week before taxes. I mean, I just don't think it's. I don't think it's the. In, term, in terms of a $27 million budget, I just don't. I mean, I think we should do what we need to do to find an exceptional superintendent. And I think the extra 5,000, I, I don't see what that. It's not about the dollars. Money. It's not necessarily about the well, dollars to me. It's more. We're getting the money, maybe. Well, if, if the top of our range is still 150, then maybe not. But what if, the, what if the person that we like is somebody who doesn't have an enormous amount of experience? And I, I, don't, I don't know that that would deter somebody. I mean, we, we have had people come here who have looked at this who was at lesser salary than what they were making because they really like Northampton and they know they're going to make less in Northampton than you know, where they might have been before. I mean, I, I just think I. I I agree that we shouldn't be foolish around around dollars because we want somebody who can come in and lead our, our district well. But I also don't want us to be any looser than we need to be with our money when our budget is so incredibly tight. Um, okay, so, Ms. Minnick, Ms. Minnick, and then Ms. Duvall. Um, I, I, I was holding my comment a little bit, and Stephanie actually raised the issue, so I'm going to say the same thing. I am concerned about our budget. I mean, I'm sure that everyone around this table remembers what it felt like this last spring sitting here not knowing whether we were going to have to let a dozen teachers go. I mean, it's not, it, this is, uh, I realize, I, I'm, I'm, I, have a, I have a business mentality, so I absolutely agree with what you've just said, that $10,000 is a very good investment often, and we would maybe reap great rewards for making that kind of commitment. But I also want us to remember how difficult it is for us to find that money in our budget. Um, we passed an override. I don't know what the public thought that was going to be used for, and I think investing in an educational leader might be what they thought we would do. But I think, I just, I think we have to be very careful and very cautious about what we consider as as the range, what we consider as how we're spending our money, because 
I'm, I dare say that the more money we put into the superintendent's salary, the fewer people there will be in the central office to assist that person. That's just I'll my taste on the whole thing. Based on what I've seen over 20 years, I think we'll cut somebody in the central office to pay for it. Well, you don't really have anyone else to right. cut, so it won't be a big problem, will it? My turn. Ms. Duvall. Okay. Um, when I was at the principal search out at Ryan Road, one of the things that the teachers really said that they wanted was a strong leader. Taking that, I'm thinking that that's probably what they want also from the district, for a strong leader for a superintendent. I don't think us raising the superintendent's fees, I don't really think we're going to have to worry about the, all the teachers, 300, 400 teachers or whatever. Um, feeling that it's unfair if we do our job well and hire somebody who does their job well and who has the experience and who is strong and who is a leader and who goes in and makes them feel appreciated for what they're doing. You, you ask if we remember what it feels like to sit and have to cut and, and chop away. I totally remember that. But what I really also remember is a superintendent that we had that we were giving a chance to who was who was working with us and it was going really well who felt underappreciated because he wasn't paid what he wanted to be paid and he wasn't paid his worth we have here an experienced superintendent who is very very much respected um, and I say that from having gone away and how many people knew of her and we're just highly impressed and said how lucky we were to have her I think that it would be foolish of us to not take her advice as far as based on the experience and she said something to me which has really stuck with me and I can even see already ways that it's cost us money but penny wise and pound foolish I mean we may be saving a little bit on the superintendent position but are we really um, just as a matter of, of me going away last weekend if it had been paid for when it was a, when it was first brought up and just even the idea of professional development um, she found the value in it and sent. I mean, it, it saves us money in the long run to be able to do it. And I, I think we need somebody who knows that. And I just really wanted to say that we need a strong leadership from the top down. And I really remember what it felt like to lose our superintendent. And that's the worst. I want somebody who comes in who knows right from the beginning we are serious. We are willing to pay what needs to be paid, not over the top. And it's not whether or not Amherst is or Amherst isn't. It's whether or not, especially with all the different um, superintendency positions open now it's whether or not we are competitive enough to attract the best and we have an awful lot of fine qualities that don't have anything to do with finances which I think we will out out that outweigh other cities you know just what Northampton is but I don't think we should just try to like Alden said a hundred dollars a week we don't I don't think we should just snip 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 away because we lost somebody already I don't want to lose somebody else and we can't lose anyone else at Central there's nobody else to lose so. Any any other questions um, or comments about Mr. Moore? Yeah, I, you know I feel like um, maybe it's because of the water we swim in we're going to end up having to pay more. But I think a couple of observations. One is that that water we swim in, it, it, if 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 every district that's looking for a new superintendent has to post the salary at the average or above. Of, of, what the of what the salary range for superintendents in the Commonwealth is, you can see very quickly the average salary of a superintendent will go up every year. And the other phenomenon that we've touched on here is turnover in superintendents. And if the average salary of superintendents is going up that rapidly because everybody, whenever they post a new superintendent position, has to post at average or above, um, you create a tremendous incentive for people to leave their job, all the people who are below average now, all of a sudden, who were at average, um, to leave their job and look for another job where they will get paid at average or above. And so, so while we may very well have to participate in that process in order to get a superintendent of the quality we're looking at, we have to recognize also that we are playing a small role in creating some of the conditions in the market that that are really unsustainable for us over the long term. So while we may have no choice but to participate in it, 
because we cannot be the holdouts where we know we only offer average or below. <laughs> um, on the other hand, as we do offer average or above in order to be competitive in the market for superintendents, we are contributing to something which we've all bemoaned, which is the constantly rising costs and the high rate of turnover among superintendents. So um, it's a, it, 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 we may have to do with something which, which won't be entirely in our best interest in the long run. Ms. Minnick. All right, just to summarize my position, I think I've said that I'm uncomfortable really with the, um, with actually putting the salary range in the ad, but I would defer, I, obviously this is a democracy here, so if the rest of the committee votes for that, I wouldn't, I'm not going to be terribly upset. I would, however, agree with Stephanie that I think the range should be broadened maybe to 135 to 150, okay. rather than the 140 to 150. Okay, so, but, uh, so just to kind of regroup where we are, there's been a motion made by Mr. Bourne and seconded to uh, create a range 140 to 150. I don't know, I don't know what, whether your intent was that that's a posted range or whether that's a, um, or whether you're deferring to NESDEC on how I'm to deferring proceed. deferring to, I mean, I, I mean, the other question I had is kind of what's common practice in the area that Every other district is going to be advertising a range, and we're going to be the only district, and so people are going to assume that we're not going to pay well. Or, I mean, it would be helpful to know kind of what the I could, practice. I is. could ask Nesdec um, their advice, and yeah, I would defer okay. to whatever whatever is going to Nesdec. Help okay. Get a superintendent. So that's the motion that's on the table, Ms. Um, yes. So, Mr. Meyer, I have, I have great respect for the superintendent's understanding of. Uh, this position of the requirements of the position and of what we need to do as a school committee to recruit uh, an excellent superintendent. So I guess the question that I have in looking at this jump is that we would be going from 131, the bottom of the range at 140. Hypothetically, it's a 11, almost 11 percent jump. So uh, my question to the superintendent would be that seems to indicate, and that's the bottom of the range, that we as a district, and you know this having spent time as the superintendent and knowing the demands of the job, we have been underpaying our superintendent significantly for a good time. You have. Okay. That's There's no doubt in my mind about that. And I think also, um, I think that as a lot of school committee members who are lay people, we really don't understand responsibility level of what a superintendent does and the fact that if you look at this as a CEO position uh, which it is uh, and you're looking at 140 to 150 thousand um, you're not exactly at an average and in fact you're not at the average of superintendent salaries in Massachusetts even at 150 I mean I didn't even assume that you would be but I certainly would not assume that you're going to get someone even without superintendent experience and ask them to be paid at 120 to 130,000. Um, it, it is not a reasonable expectation. And you have something here. And frankly, I think if you went out and asked every teacher in this district, they're not going to have a problem with this because what they want is leadership. And they know that to get good leadership, you're going to have to pay some money. So I think this is a very reasonable amount, and I think it will draw you some of the people that you want. And I don't think you can continue forever to underpay everyone in your system mm -hmm. under the aura that this is Northampton, mm -hmm. which is a wonderful place to live, and a lot of people are willing to come here. But I think when you're looking for the strong leadership you want and the education that you want for your kids here, you need to pay something that's reasonable, and I think this is reasonable. I just want to make a quick um, statement um, when you brought it up as, as comparison to a CEO position. Um, I just was um, to this weekend talking to somebody and they mentioned that in the private uh, sector that HEC, the collaborative uh, program, that they over there make over $190,000. That's correct. And I just wanted to state, you know, I, I would agree with what you're saying that I think that as Northampton we should stop saying, you know, come to our pretty town and we should just pay what, what they're worth. 
and take it and say and say that we're glad with that we got money. it for less. With what money? You know what? But I'm what sorry. Money are we going to have to say? With what money? Well, you may, you know, maybe if you got yourself some strong <coughs> leadership here right. in the superintendent position, maybe that superintendent, along with the school committee, could help sell the community on the fact that you need to have good quality education, which you also need to pay for. And maybe you the could do some lobbying at the state gave level us as well. Money. I mean, I think that's the best thing we can ask from them. Where the breakdown is, is that Northampton continues to lag behind in state funding because we were doing just good enough and we've never gotten anything more than the minimal per student funding in Chapter 7. And that's and why you need to lobby the state as well. And how much lobbying do we do? That was one of the, the um, programs that I went to this weekend that they said that it, it really matters. Um, I can't remember the senator that was there but um, and the representative was there also. but. They said it really matters that we get our districts, because that was a question I asked. What do we do when we're stuck and we're in Northampton and we're at the bottom? What do we do to get out? We lobby. We actually take active, proactive approaches and go to and, and write our senators, write our representatives, and lobby. And they said that we really don't do that very well or very effectively as a district, that we need to step it up. And that's how we have to get our state funding. All so. we have to do is vote a resolution and instruct our we had a legislative liaison to. No, I'm not. I'm oh, who is? Do we even have a legislative liaison any longer? We do. It's Alden. Yeah. Oh, Alden. But we also have the conference committee, and, yeah, they, and they wrote a message. That's what I mean. That's what it's I think. Okay. I think we're getting a little far afield now. Uh, All right. Oh, just as a point of information, Stan Rosenberg, uh, the president of this elect of the Senate, will be in Northampton on. The 13th, I believe, is the date. That may change, but in early January, along with our representative Peter Kokot, to discuss precisely how we might get more revenue. So we are we are lobbying. It is, but again, it's it's not. It hasn't been easy in the past, and it won't be going forward. Okay. So I guess the question is: We have a motion on the table that's been seconded uh, to set the range um, 140 to 150. Um, are there any further questions or comments about that? Um, there could be a, clearly there could be amendments to that if someone wishes to try to make an amendment to the motion. Um, uh, I just want people to understand what the parameters are. I have one more question for um, Superintendent Nash. When you came up to 140 to 150, how did you come up to that? Why was it not 140 to 160, 150 to 160? I mean, is well, frankly, I considered the economic situation that Northampton finds itself in, okay. and I felt the most you could go was 150. Okay. Um, do I think the job should be paid more? Yes, but I think at 150 you can get a quality leader, and that's what you need. Thank you. Ms. I'm, I'm kind of I'm curious. Um, when districts have higher salaries for their superintendents, I assume they have higher salaries for their other administrators as well. So I raised the question before, is what's the repercussion going to be? And, and I don't think that we, there's a really an answer to this, but just for us to think about, what's the repercussion going to be if we raise our salary from our superintendent from 130 to 150? Um, what is that going to mean for our negotiations with all of the rest of the administrators as those contracts come, come up? Um, it, it's not. It's not just a one. Uh, it's not just one salary. I really do think that there are going to be ripples out, and you know, I'm concerned. I, th I think that we have to keep this in balance with what's going on in the rest of the city in terms of salary ranges. And um, I, I, it, what? At what expense, though? These are our children that we're talking about. Their education. We need. These are our community members who we pay, for, you know, for fire and for police and for public works. And yes, we do education also. And obviously, I think education is important. And I want the best superintendent that we can get. But I'm also a taxpayer here, and I'm representing other taxpayers here. And I, I think doing a twenty thousand dollar jump in salary is going to rub some people the wrong way. It may, but if if we focus it and we sell we sell the point, just as we did our bus contract. Uh, look at how lucky we were that for all of these years we were uh, we got to underpay. We've been underpaying our superintendent if we sell it as far as, and now we're just catching it's up. It's not to just about selling it, it's about paying it out. And you know, right now, every year we're fighting about whether or not we're going to have any portion of a curriculum director. We go up $20,000, how much curriculum director are we going to have? I don't know the answer to that. I don't think any of us actually does. No, but if we have a strong superintendent, perhaps they would. Perhaps if we had, if we really had, still have to pay that person day one. 
we still have to work that into the budget day one. <laughs> I don't want to argue, but I can just point. Out, I could point. I out think starting at one, lost money starting at one forty is. A, it makes me uncomfortable. It's a little bit higher than I want to start at. Do it. So then the question would be: We have a vote. So if that, if if someone wants to offer an amendment, they can certainly do that. If not, we have to take a vote on the motion that's on the table. Mrs. Minnick. I move that we amend the motion to say that the salary range that to which we're uh, the salary range that we're going to consider is one thirty-five to one fifty. So now there's been an amendment to the main motion to uh, set the range at 135 to 150. And this is, that's what his motion was, is, am I correct, to set the range or was his motion to put that in the ad? Set the range. Just to set the range. Okay. okay. Yes. Okay. And he's, he's amenable to what NESDEC recommends. Okay. Um, so. Um, I'm confused on that because I had asked why we don't why not a twenty thousand dollar buffer and we had i believe i got a good answer to that and yet now we're going to be putting a fifteen thousand dollar buffer um, well the easiest way to make the decision is to vote on the amendment if you, you i just don't know but if the answer was there is a better reason then why would we still be doing it would well, be you my need question. to ask the maker of the motion because uh, you're if i was told that the twenty thousand dollars made wasn't right wasn't appropriate to have that kind of range why do you feel that a fifteen thousand dollar range is any better for the answer that i received when i originally said between 130 and 150 and then there was a reason why not why do you think that one was, would you remind me what that reason was why what the reason was be, maybe miss maybe superintendent nash would well i think two reasons I, I think that 140 is as low as you should go for the position that's here uh, and that's assuming that you find someone on the low side of experience. I so also it think that 135, about I think 135 sends a very different message than 140. Um, and I think that the type of people you want to attract, that difference in $5,000, I think will make a difference. Um, I think then someone without a lot of experience may say, I can do this job and it's 140, the minimum they'll give me. You put 135, they're going to assume it's going to be 135 they're going to get. I think it's just that difference. So it has nothing to do with $10,000 or $20,000 spread. It had to do with her actual, she actually analyzed what she felt were the appropriate salaries, minimum and maximum. After talking with a lot of people, yes. So, it, so it's not, so it's not about the spread. It's not about twenty thousand, fifteen thousand, ten thousand. It's true. It's about specific okay, dollar sorry, amounts. I thought it was the spread, and that would give us create the average, and then people would expect and it to be one hundred and forty based on. And I'm, I'm. So that's fine. You know, and with respect to what she's said, I'm suggesting that maybe we could go slightly lower than that. And one of the things that I'm thinking is that if somebody can look up, I, I don't know if the superintendent contract is public. I know that the salaries are made public, but if somebody goes and finds our superintendent contract, they'll find that there are some compensation in there for professional development. And if you recall, we actually made significant compensation for continuing education professional development for our last superintendent. And if you take total compensation for our, our superintendent, as opposed to just the listed salary in the appropriations budget, you will you will remember that the salary wasn't 131,000. It really comes up to more like 136. I remember he wasn't happy. I still remember even that. That's, not, that's, that's really not. But I'm just saying the money. Discussing and, and the point she is that wasn't enough. That if there was considerable discussion on how much professional development we could afford to pay that superintendent, I'm saying that the same discussion happens when you're negotiating a new contract about the actual salary and whether we'll include professional development or any other kind of additional compensation in the package. So, I'm I. Just made a motion for an amendment. Okay, did so not mean to alienate anyone or irritate anyone or or disregard anyone's professional advice. I'm I've just put it out okay. there. So there's been a motion made and seconded to amend the original motion uh, to expand the range from 135 from 140 to 150 from to 135 to 150. All those in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 Okay, so there's four ayes. All those opposed say nay. 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 Um, I think you need a roll call. 
I'm actually uh, wondering if we can have a roll call because I'm. Uh, it's late. Yes. No. No. So now we're back to the main motion, uh, which is to set the range from 140 to 150. Uh, is there further discussion on that? Hearing none, uh, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Mr. Michael yes. So the motion carries. Um, okay. So could I also um, get a m motion relative to the language that was discussed earlier, which was just again adding the language superintendent experience preferred but not required? I make a motion to accept the language as amend as um, stated by um, Superintendent Nash, and not to post it, but to be have it. To, if, is that what you're looking for now? No, 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 just that, that we were okay. just going to then make that slight adjustment to the language. Experience preferred. But we didn't ask for a vote earlier, necessary. so I just was we're hoping to do experience. it all in one vote. Superintendent but. experience preferred, but right. not, not necessary, right. right. Yeah. So is there a second on that motion? <clears throat> Any discussion on this? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Um, the only other, uh, I guess, remaining question is, well, first of all, I, um, I would ask that the vice chair, uh, Mr. Zahowski, serve on, as sort of the committee's, li as the liaison to the school committee from the search process, having served on the last process and in his role as vice chair, if you'll accept that okay. appointment. Sure. Um, and then I guess I need to discuss um, the, uh, I, we may want to discuss with our friends from NESDEC when they're here, but the, I've already had several people send me emails saying they'd be willing to serve on the next search committee. Um, and so I guess uh, my, I guess what I would like guidance from, um, I guess when we get ready to go forward with the formal search, I'm assuming we will want to have a similar screening committee as before. And, that, and then the question is, do we open that up again to the public to have people who wish to serve on it um, as opposed to trying to get the same committee to continue um, or some combination thereof. Ms. Duvall. Well, if we, get, if we do open it up to get people and members of the community, then I think that um, to serve on it, that I've received feedback from people who sent it in and were very upset, sent in requests and were very upset that they didn't understand what the criteria was or what we were looking for and they felt excluded and that they didn't. I mean, so I think that we need to be sensitive to that, to that process, so. Okay. Okay. Yeah, uh, Ms. Pick. Just in terms of um, precedent, when we did this two and a half years ago and we did two searches, we did use the same committee. I think we had um, one or two, we had a school committee person leave who was replaced and we had one community member um, who came off and was replaced, but in general we used the same um, committee and that worked very well because we can kind of just pick up where we were. And I would say that we had a good working committee this time and I um, I would be all in favor of your, you know, putting out an, um, an email to see who might be interested in serving again um, if, if you decide to go that way. And then for people who don't, is to you know look at the at the makeup and what what um, groups are being represented and who's not and try to to fill those in, but um, we had a, we had a hardworking um, very collaborative committee. Could the superintendent yeah. wanted to just make a comment on that and then I, I just think that since you have Nesdec coming to your December twelfth meeting, you really don't need to make a decision on this tonight. Okay. And I would I would suggest that maybe the Nesdec people 
would have that discussion with you as to criteria, which I think is very important so people feel that they are represented and heard. Um, and with regard to numbers of committee members and how they might be spread across your constituency groups. So I think that's a good, a good thing for NESDEC to talk with you about next time. Um, all I wanted to say that I don't feel the need to have the same members. Um, again, I think that part of the reason that I did feel that need for the first one was because um, being an optimist thinking if we were going to be successful with our first search and it was under time constraints the way originally we had, were going to set it up that um, I thought that it would be a nice flow because those were the same people that successfully hired somebody, I guess successfully because they didn't stay so I don't know. But anyway, I just didn't feel that, that, that it's necessary at this point since we have a longer period of time. So that's just my opinion. Okay. Um, so I guess actually, I guess maybe I should backtrack a little and say this may be an item then to discuss when we are when we hear from NESDEC next time yeah. and we can then make a decision after that discussion um, okay so that completes the um, that completes I believe our discussion of the new search process um, is there any new business okay um, hearing none, I, well, I just have to announce that our next uh, scheduled school committee meeting is December 12th, 2013 uh, at 7.15 uh, p.m. here in the JFK Community Room. And now I will entertain that motion. motion. To, okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor of adjourning say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. The meeting is adjourned.